This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. Today I'm going to be going solo talking about Say, 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 Say's Law. I had to get that out of my system. Before we dive into the fun stuff, let me mention something else that's also fun but exciting and useful for you is that the Mises Institute is giving away 100,000 copies of Murray Rothbard's classic, What Has Government Done to Our Money? So there's no charge to you, at least if it's domestic shipping. And you just go to Mises.org slash money to get your copies. So you know if you've never read it yourself, they're happy to send you one for your personal use. But also, if you know coworkers, friends, some local study group that might benefit from it. A homeschooling group would certainly be a good target. And you can go ahead and go to Mises.org slash money, get some free copies shipped, and hand them out. Spread the word. Okay, so in this episode, I'm going to be talking about what's called Say's Law. So it's named after Jean-Baptiste Say from his 1803 work, which in English is a treatise on political economy. He wrote it in French originally, of course, um, and it's it, it has to do with like a, called the law of markets, and then over time, people just start referring to it as Say's law. Okay, so he was not being arrogant and calling it that. That happens a lot. I'm sure many of you have noticed in the history of ideas. I was just working on something. Uh, William Sharp has this thing called the Sharp Index or the Sharp Ratio, named after him, it has to do with an asset's excess return above the risk-free asset divided by the standard deviation of its returns, right? So it's like the ex, the uh, extra earnings per unit of extra risk is the idea. And I went in his original 1966 paper, he didn't call it Sharpe's Ratio. He called it Reward to Variability Index or something like that. And then later people just called it, oh yeah, the Sharpe Index or the Sharpe Ratio. Okay, so same thing here. Um, say just if you were if you were reading the treatise, it's you might not even have thought if you didn't already know that oh this section right here, this is where there's going to be something really famous that is going to go down for centuries and people are going to refer to this thing. There's going to be partisans, you know, advocates of government intervention are going to mock this idea and say how outmoded and obsolete it is. And how could anybody think that? Whereas the fans of the free market are going to say, "No, this is a deep principle that you all should learn." And um, you know, let's let's take a moment to appreciate this guy. So the point of today's episode, of course, is to unpack it, tell you what was it that say actually had in mind with this. So incidentally, let me just read the particular edition that the Mises Institute has at its website. By the way, so the Mises Institute has all sorts of classic works in PDF form, not just stuff that it published itself or even just Austrian, you know, proper classics, but even, for example, Say's Treatise here. You've got the, the free PDF hosted at the Mises website. So anyway, for their particular one, um, you know how these things start and then the beginning, like with each successive edition, somebody says something and then, you know, that's often included in the latest version. So you have all that history of the, the notes and introductions and such. So anyway, I thought this, this one caught my eye just to give you a sense of w how big a deal this work was at the time. So this is the advertisement to the American edition, or sorry, it's an advertisement by the American editor for the fifth edition of this particular printing. <clears throat> no work upon political economy since the publication of Dr. Adam Smith's profound and original inquiry in the nature and causes of the wealth of nations has attracted such general attention and received such distinguished marks of approbation from competent judges as the Traite d'Economie Politique of M. Say. It was first printed in Paris in the year 1803 and subsequently has passed through five large editions that have received various corrections and improvements from the author. Translations of the work have been made into the German, Spanish, Italian, and other languages, and has been adopted as a textbook in all the universities of the continent of Europe in which this new but essential branch of liberal education is now taught. The four former American editions of this translation have also been introduced 
into many of the most respectable of our own seminaries of learning. It is unquestionably the most methodical, comprehensive, and best digested treatise on the elements of political economy that has yet been presented to the world. It exhibits a clear and systematical view of all the solid and important doctrines of this very extensive and difficult science unfolded in their proper order and connection. In the establishment of his principles, the author's reasonings, with but few exceptions, are logical and accurate, delivered with distinctness and perspicuity, and generally supported by the fullest and most satisfactory illustrations. A rigid adherence to the inductive method of investigation and the prosecution of almost every part of his inquiry has enabled M. Say to effect a nearly complete analysis of the numerous and complicated phenomena of wealth and to enunciate and establish, with all the evidence of demonstration, the simple and general laws on which its production, distribution, and consumption depend. Okay, so I'll stop there. Okay, so that's where they're coming from. And this, by the way, just to give you the historical context of this, so remember, or you're learning it for the first time if no one's told you this before, that the who we re- typically refer to as the classical economists are the people before the so-called marginal subjectivist revolution. So in the early 1870s, Karl Menger and the boys, specifically uh, two of them in 1871, and then I think Wal Ross was in 1874, if I'm not getting mixed up. Um, the, but there's three, it's Karl Menger, Leon Wal Ross, and William Stanley Jevons are credited as being co-discoverers, even though they worked independently. It's not like they were collaborating on um, bringing what we now think of as marginal utility theory into economics. And that supplanted the classical approach, which relied on a cost theory of value more generally and more specifically some version of a labor theory of value. Okay, and so you might have thought that, oh, the labor theory of value, that's Karl Marx, right? Well, it's also Adam Smith and also the great French classical economists like J.B. Say and Frederick Bastiat. So um, if you, for example, but but it's worth reading where I'm going with this because when you see it in their presentation, right? So Bastiat, the petition of the candle makers, here we're going to be focusing on Say and you know his, his so-called law of markets to talk about can a can a general insufficiency of aggregate demand explain recessions? That's that's what this has to do with. Um, and it's great stuff. And so you might think, ah, yes, this ancient wisdom that was lost in these guys. But when you go and read it, you do see, oh, even though these guys were sharp, and yes, they do have a lot of wisdom in their writing, and modern economics has lost much of what they knew in its attempt to mathematize everything. Still, they got some stuff wrong, or at the very least, they went down cul-de-sacs in terms of their theoretical investigations, put it that way, All right? So there's a passage, and I don't remember if it's in Bastiat or in Say. It's it's probably Say, but I I can't, I can't remember for sure, because the, the period when I was getting into this stuff, I was reading both of them. But one of them, they, they were saying something like, um, you know, that the scarcity of human labor is like the ultimate break on the creation of products. And so that's the ultimate regulator of market value, right? That, those were their exact words, but that was kind of principle. And the person went through, the writer went through like a thought experiment, like, oh, some guy's out in the woods and he's got to go to the river to get fish or something and bring them back. Or maybe he's going to get water. I don't remember what he was doing. And the idea was like nature is just giving its produce without charging you for it. And it's ultimately your use of your scarce time and labor power that kind of regulates, you know, if you want to have more of your cabin in the woods or if you want to have more fish or blah, blah, blah. It's ultimately your choice of what do you do with your body that regulates the various quantities of those possible outputs. And so if you think about it in the grand scheme, ultimately human labor is the thing that determines economic value. All right, so that's, In the narrow uh, constraints of the analysis, that's correct. But as a general rule, no, that just doesn't work. The labor theory of value, it's not like, oh, it might lead to Marxism. I mean, it might, and that's not a good thing. But more fundamentally, it's just, it's not a good way to explain stuff, right? If you're walking out in the woods and you see 
a brand new car sitting there and you don't think anybody else has title to it and you take it to determine, hey, do I like this? Does this thing have value to me? You don't need to know, hang on, how much human labor went into this? That That's not how the explanation works. It's you using other principles to figure out the value of something. And then when you get more specific, you know, on the margin, that's an issue too. Um, and then that, those considerations help inform, should I use another hour of my labor to make more of this particular item? Right? It's not the other way around. It's not that your labor causes the value. And in fairness, if you read Bastiat or Say, or Adam Smith for that matter, or David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, right? They're not, I don't think they come out and say, is a philosophical, metaphysical matter, yes, human labor creates this entity called economic value that then flows into things. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, Aristotle possibly says things close to that. Um, but th it's not that they're saying things that are just demonstrably erroneous, but rather they're building up a framework with which to explain market exchange rates that really only works for the particular narrow uh, thought experiments that they set up. You know, it's things like, well, what happens, you know, we, Picasso's not around anymore, so how do we value his paintings? Well, it's certainly not considerations of if we wanted to make one more, you know, how much labor, you know, would we have to withdraw from other areas to make one more unit of Picasso's paintings? And then, you know, that's kind of the way we'd figure it, right? So there's a lot of arguments along those lines in the classical work that make sense for reproducible commodities, but when it comes off to non-reproducible things like a work of art from a painter who's dead, you, you know, that just doesn't work. But that doesn't mean, oh, Picasso's paintings are valueless or we have no means as economists of explaining. Like, no, you use what we now call subjective value theory to explain that stuff. All right. So that innovation was what Menger and Walras and Jevons ushered into economic science in the early 1870s. And that's what we call the marginal revolution. All right, so um, having said all that, it might sound like I'm telling you don't bother reading the classics. No, I'm the opposite. I'm saying go read it because it's fascinating to see how they grappled with these ideas in their own thought processes. And a lot of times, like I say, it's going to be what, like what I just said. But to give you a different example, you may have heard economists, even people lecturing you know, at Mises University – and I'm sure I've said this too, you know, talking to undergrads or something at the blackboard, it may have led people to believe that Adam Smith couldn't understand why a diamond had a higher market price than a gallon of water. You know, it's called the, the water diamond paradox. And yes and no, right? It's, I mean, if you ask them, they would say, oh, it's scarcity. Like they, they, they were not stupid. They understand that at some level. But the point was, as economic theorists, their framework was not very well suited to handling cases like that because they weren't starting from the raw valuation of units on the margin. Instead, they were using other principles, like starting on the cost of production side and then coming up with general rules of thumb. Like if there were consistently higher profits from making stagecoaches, Rather than log cabins, well, then entrepreneurs, you know, they would switch out of log cabin production and they would make more stagecoaches. And so then the increased quantity of stagecoaches or the supply would push down, you know, its, it's scarcity would fall. And so that would be less valuable, whereas there'd be more scarcity now with the log cabins. And so its value would rise. And so ultimately that would happen until the rate of profit in both industries was comparable. And then that you know, tweaking would stop. And so that's why blah, 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 you know, ultimately it's a, it's a cost of production theory to explain final market prices of retail goods. But, you know, so there's nothing wrong in that demonstration of those arguments, but you could just, again, that doesn't help explain, okay, so that's why somebody, some old, uh, widow dies and has his biggest state and the people are going through her stuff and find that she was a collector of 
paintings from old masters. And then, oh, wow, look at there's some new paintings from these old guy Rembrandt or whatever that we didn't know existed. And then, you know, the, the experts come in and validate it and say, yep, that really is a Rembrandt that we just didn't know about until now. Well, then how do we value that? It's certainly not. Well, if there's a higher rate of profit in the classic paintings sector, then resources are going to flow out of log cabin production into the production of more Rembrandt. You see what I mean? So that that's this type of thing um, where go read it to see how they grappled with it. But ultimately, later thinkers, when they would come up with a better framework that was more internally consistent, could handle more cases, right? So the the labor, th or sorry, the subjectivist marginal value theory that displaced the old cost-based or even labor theory of value, to my mind, is like a classic example of just progress and scientific explanation. It's like how Einstein's theories of general and special relativity displaced Newtonian mechanics because anything Newton could explain, so could Einstein's framework, and then he could handle other cases where the Newtonian framework just was totally wrong. And so likewise here, the framework of explaining value that Menger, you know, the Ostrids would say the, did it the best way, but then Jevons and while Ross and their own different uh, idioms, that just, it's, it's a more robust framework. You can, ex anything that you could explain with the old approach in terms of reproducible goods and, you know, long run markets and, you know, making statements about long run rates of profit and whatever, you can do all that with the new subjectivist marginalist approach, but you can also explain one off things like what if you're just in the woods and you find some brand new car, how do you value that if you don't know how much labor went into it? Or, you know, the Picasso that nobody knew about, how do you value that? It's certainly not an issue of, well, what would it cost in terms of opportunity cost with other re other possible goods if we wanted to make one more of this? Okay. Um, so when it comes to Say's Law, the issue is, the, re the reason it's so controversial is modern statements of it often, in my view, don't get across what it was he was trying to say. So if you... You've probably heard it, if you have heard of it, as people might say, oh, Say's Law, oh yeah, he said that supply creates its own demand. That's the very pithy, succinct statement of what most economists nowadays, if you grabbed them and said, what's Say's Law? It wouldn't surprise me if a bunch of them didn't even know. I don't know what you're talking about. But those that did know would probably say something like, oh, the, the actual statement was supply creates its own demand. And, and they might even go further and say something like this. So here, I'm not quoting from someone literally, but I think you definitely will get this mindset from modern critics of Say's Law, particularly like from Keynesians who believe in the need for active demand management from either the monetary authority and or the fiscal authority. Um, they, they, they might say something like, oh yeah, Say was one of those classical economists. He believed in the power of markets to self-correct. He didn't think long-run um, unemployment w was possible, that the market would just fix that. Uh, another way of saying is he thought that a general glut was impossible, that it couldn't be that just all the merchants had unsold goods, that Say thought that that was li literally impossible because if you bring up products to market, you know, if you have the supply, that should... JB say thought create its own demand in the system somehow. There should be, you know, symmetrical demands for a given supply. And that's how everybody should just be able to meet up and prices adjust and boom, boom, boom. And, you know, recession should be impossible. And then it took the Great Depression in the 1930s when all of the econ economists who were very laissez faire in their policy views were just wrong. And they were just kept telling the political authorities, no, no, no. Don't intervene. Just wait. Just wait. The market will fix itself. It always has. We've got J.B. Say's authority telling us so. This is impossible to have a general glut of unsold goods just piling up in the shelves. That can't be. And then John Maynard Keynes fortunately came along in 1936 with his general theory, right? So the same ideas like Einstein, that Keynes was saying, ah, yes, the classical economists 
had this whole framework that was correct in its, you know, if they stayed in their lane. In the special case of, of an economy in full employment, Keynes argued, then the stuff about the classical economists talk about is correct. Right? If you want to have more of you want to have more stagecoaches, then you got to have fewer log cabins, right? There's opportunity costs, there's scarcity. Um, if, if the government spends more, then that means the private sector has to spend less, at least in real terms, right? So there's, there's crowding out, we would say, in, our, in modern ter terminology. However, Keynes said in his 1936 classic, in general, the economy might not be at full employment. Aggregate demand could be below the level needed to sustain full employment and the economy can get stuck in that rut and left to its own devices, it might take years to get out of that. It's not just going to self-correct very quickly. And so that's why you need the monetary authority to first cut interest rates. But then if you're in a liquidity trap, you can be in a situation where they can push rates down to zero and it still doesn't fix it. And then you need the fiscal authority to come in and run big budget deficits to boost aggregate demand, right? They're, by their spending, they're pumping demand into the economy. And since they're running a deficit, they're not, you know, they're not taxing it right back out. And so that's the way the government can boost aggregate demand and restore full employment. And then, you know, the workers get those wages, then they go and spend, and it's kind of a cascade process in the system just grows out of that slump. And then once it, you know, it's back on its feet and the workers are earning enough to go buy the products that they're making in the aggregate, then the government can step back. All right, that's kind of the framework. And so you see there how they're caricaturing or caricaturizing, uh, say, is saying, oh, he had this notion that recessions were impossible and he thought supply created its own demand. All right, so if that's what you think Say was arguing, well, then, yeah, he's wrong. Because for one thing, recessions do happen. By the way, as an aside, historically, there's a continued watering down of the term to make it sound less scary. All right, so back in the day, like in the 1800s and then the early 1900s, they called them panics. Right, like, um, you know, the Panic of 1907 or Rothbard's, what is it, the Panic of 1819 was, I think, like his doctoral dissertation, right? And then is a euphemism, they started calling them depressions with a small d, right? Just think about it. Would you rather be panicked or depressed? <laughs> what's, what's a more serious issue, right? And then after the Great Depression, they started calling them recessions, right? So I'm just saying over time... It, I'm not saying there was like a, oh, and then after this date, from that point forward, it was only referred to as a depression. And then after this date, it was only, but I'm just saying you can kind of see the overlapping uh, timelines of those different uh, titles or labels that they put on economic calamities, like, you know, the boom bust cycle. All right. So certainly say understood that occasionally the market economy gets stuck in a rut. And there's a lot of people who have skills, they're good workers, they're eager, and they just can't find work. And it seems like this occurs in a cyclic pattern. And why does that happen? All right. So I don't know enough off the top of my head to tell you what was J.B. Say's theory as to what caused the business cycle. But my point is, he didn't think business cycles are impossible. For one thing, if he thought they never happened, then why would he be, how would we know what he thought? Right, I'm sure it's not like in say his treatise it talks about, um, you know, it, is there a civilization on Venus? To my knowledge, I don't think he talks about that. Right, because they wouldn't even. Why would he talk about something so obscure and non-existent? Right. So if you just think it through, if the classical economists are telling us, no, 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 the government doesn't need to intervene when there's a recession in order to get out of it they're admitting that there could be a recession, okay? So that's kind of what I'm, what I'm getting at here, that um, clearly Say could not possibly have been saying the government doesn't need to intervene to get us out of a recession because recessions are impossible. The whole reason we're having the argument is because recessions do periodically happen, 
And then a lot of people, especially like in the merchant class, clamor for special government interventions to help them. And the classical economists in the you know the free market tradition, especially the French, they were very good uh, in, in many respects, uh, just would point out, well, no, that actually would make things worse. Or as we'll see here in the case of Say, that it's just, it, it's a non sequitur. Okay, so why don't I, after that long prelude, read to you, because I think this is really the only way to do it. It's going to be, I'm not, I'm reading probably the equivalent of one full page, just so you brace yourself or, you know, get ready. All right, it's, it spills over, like it starts the middle of one, so it's, it's over the course of two pages, but I think it, it's basically one page. So this is coming from book one, chapter 15. The title of this chapter is Of the Demand or Market for, per, for Products. All right, so here I'm just going to read this and then I'll comment. It is common to hear adventurers in the different channels of industry assert that their difficulty lies not in the production, but in the disposal of commodities, that products would always be abundant if there were but a ready demand or market for them. When the demand for their commodities is slow, difficult, and productive of little advantage, they pronounce money to be scarce. The grand object of their desire is a consumption brisk enough to quicken sales and keep up prices. But ask them what peculiar causes and circumstances facilitate the demand for their products, and you will soon perceive that most of them have extremely vague notions of these matters, that their observation of facts is imperfect, and their explanation still more so that they treat doubtful points as matter of certainty, often pray for what is directly opposite to their interests, and importunately solicit from authority a protection of the most mischievous tendency. Okay, so let me just pause. So you see what's going on here. The context of this is say is saying, it often happens that when business is bad, when business is slumping, sales are way down, that the merchants will say, oh yeah, the problem is the public doesn't have enough money. If you know, money is too scarce right now, that's the issue. It's not a matter of production. Look at, we got tons of goods on our shelves, right? It's not, it's not a matter of, we don't know how to make things or that we lacked the resources. No, we did make it. They're sitting right here and I just can't sell them. Well, why not? Well, if I'm trying to sell them for this certain price and there's not enough demand, so clearly, if people just had more money to buy my stuff, then that would fix the problem. And then they could pay me. I would sell them the stuff. I could use the money to go buy, you know, to replenish my warehouse or whatever, my shelves. That's how the pe the manufacturers get paid. And that's, you know, so that there you go. So the, the thing gumming up the process here, according to these, you know, hypothetical retailers that we're, we have in mind, is that my customers don't have enough money. Money is too scarce. That's the issue, All right? And so now what Say is doing in this whole chapter is he's going to walk through why that is a bad diagnosis for what ails a sluggish economy, okay? So again, Say is not going to say. Now, the reason these people are wrong is because Business is never slow. What are they talking about? Business is always brisk. That's not what he's saying. He's admitting, yeah, there are periods where the merchants collectively think we can't sell our stuff. What's going on? What went wrong? How come this you know, month is different from normal times? How come all of a sudden it's not just that I can't sell my stuff, right? If it was just one merchant and he couldn't sell his stuff, but everybody else was doing fine, you would say, well, you made the wrong thing. All right, you made too much of your stuff. You shouldn't have bought so many units of that thing. The public doesn't want that. And then you can think through, all right, and if you hadn't done that, that would have released those resources. We could have made more of something else, right? So if if merchant Jacques can't sell his products, but merchant Francois is running out of stuff, you know, stuff's flying off the shelves, the problem isn't that the public doesn't have enough money. The problem is clearly that... Jacques made the wrong stuff, and if he had made fewer units of those or bought fewer units, then that would have freed up the real resources so that Francois could have had more stuff on his shelf. So Francois is not running out, 
and Jacques isn't, you know, overflowing with unsold goods, right? So that's clear. And that is what I think a lot of modern Keynesians thought Say was saying was just true in general. But no, he was aware there can be situations where most merchants can't sell their stuff. And that's what gives rise to, so when they're all like, what's going on? They're not blaming themselves and their entrepreneurial judgment. They're saying, well, clearly the problem must be the community as a whole doesn't have enough money. That's the issue. And it might not be that a bunch of gremlins in the middle of the night took all the gold and silver coins and whisked them away. And that's it, that, you know, the public for some reason is frightened and they're hoarding their money, right? So when we say money is too scarce, it doesn't mean that the, the physical stock of money went down. They are also aware that it could mean for some reason the public now is just reluctant to spend. And that they're saying, uh-oh, and that, that causes... So what Say is doing, again, in this chapter, is he wants to say that's a very superficial diagnosis of what the ultimate problem is when you get into situations like that. But for sure, he knows you could be in a situation like that. That's why he's arguing about what's the best way to understand what's going on and what's the solution. So it's clearly not that Say thinks it's impossible for there to be a general glut. Okay, let me keep reading. Mm -hmm. Let me stop, actually. Let me just use an analogy to make sure you're getting what's what's happening here. So often you'll hear people say something like, um, oh, yeah, I, I thought it was going to rain this morning, and so I took my umbrella with me on the way to work. And then, of course, since I took the umbrella, that means it doesn't rain, right? And whenever it's like that, if I take the umbrella, guaranteed it's not going to rain, but if I don't take it, then I'm going to get you know dumped on. It always happens, huh? And so, you know, my wise guy response in a situation like that is to say, "Well, why are you lamenting that? You, you should be a billionaire if that were actually true, right? If you have the power to control the weather by whether or not you, you should go, you know, strike up a deal with a, a a professional major league baseball team, and just say, hey, whenever there's a game." I'll just make sure I take my umbrella to work that day so it doesn't rain. And then you're going to pay me, you know, a million dollars every time I do that because the rain delay messes with your business model, right? Or, you know, somebody's going to have their graduation party on a certain day and they would really like to know ahead of time, is it going to rain or not? And so you can guarantee them and say, okay, well, tell you what, if you and the other, you know, your other classmates who are also making their similar plans you guys collectively give me ten thousand dollars on that Saturday. I will. Uh, I'll go out and take my umbrella outside with you as I go around on a walk, and that'll make sure. Okay, I'm obviously being silly, guys, but you get the point that I'm saying. You're lamenting that, and actually, what you were saying were true. That would be amazing. You would be the most important per person on planet Earth, All right? So the obvious implication there. Where am I going? It's not that I actually. You know, it would be silly for if someone heard me say that. There's a lot you could say. You could say, wow, you're a jerk. Oh, you really think you're smart, don't you? You know, uh, so forth. Lots of stuff you could say. But what would be goofy for you to say in response to me making that point would be to say, oh, come on, Bob. Uh, everyone, Bob thinks that this guy could make a billion dollars just by going around to major league baseball team owners and cutting deals with them. Ha, ha, ha. Bob believes that could happen. What an idiot. When, No. I was just showing if you think what you just said is an explanation for why it didn't rain today, let's just consider the implications of that. You see how crazy that would be. So therefore, what you said initially is wrong. That's the point of going through that rhetorical demonstration, right? So that's what Say is doing here. All right, he, he's, he's just saying, well, let's see. Does that really stand up? Can we really say just as a general principle that, oh, when the economy gets stuck in a slump, the reason is that money is scarce. Let's just walk through that. And so that's what he's doing. He's showing that is not a good explanation. And then he's just going to have a bunch of considerations around that topic. Okay. So it's, it, it, it's not quite right to, to say that, oh, and, and this is why say thought, there could never be a recession because he thought this would happen, right? 
He's instead, it's more he's doing things like you're showing what your the, the so called scarcity of money could be consistent with a healthy, prosperous economy. Like, to, to give one example, because I'm, I'm not going to read this as a quote, so I'll just say it now. At one point in this discussion, Say says, like right now in Europe, or maybe he talks about France, I don't remember, you know, we're far wealthier in you know, the, late night, the late 1700s, early 1800s than our predecessors were 200 years ago, right? If you looked at the state of, you know, the European standard of living as of 1800, it was much higher than as of 1600. And his point was, how can our, what we would in our terminology call like our real standard of living, how can that be? Is it because we have more money now than people 200 years ago did? And clearly not. The reason we all live in nicer houses, we eat more food, better food, our ships are faster and safer, and that the, you know and all the things that someone writing in the year 1800 would have thought in terms of, oh, wow, we're so much better off than the people in the year 1600 is because they produced more. All the different types of merchants and, and you know producers and so on, they brought more goods and services to market per capita than was the case 200 years ago. And then, oh, do people have enough money to be able to afford it? That's kind of you know goofy when you think of it in that macro long-term perspective. That the money prices of those things can just be whatever it would need to be so that the given stock of money allows everybody to collectively buy this stuff. Because in the final analysis, it's you, it's what, what are you producing and bringing to market that allows you to bid on and obtain in exchange things that other people are bringing to the market, right? So if everybody is all of a sudden twice as productive and makes twice as much stuff, and then we go into the marketplace and haggle and walk away with our exchanges, we can all have twice as much as we did in the original equilibrium. And how is that possible? It's not because we all had more money. It's because we all produce twice as much, right? So if there's twice as much to go around, that's ultimately how people can obtain from the economy twice as much consumption. Okay, so that's where he's going with this. And clearly, what I just said doesn't rule out the possibility of there being a recession with unemployment being high for a long time. But still, everything I said is, is true, and it's important to know. If you didn't know that, if you thought, yeah, we have, you know, our standard of living is twice as high as it was X years ago on average, is twice as high, and uh, I'm not really sure. If you didn't know that the ultimate fact involved with that is that production is twice as high, well, you're not going to get anywhere. That's clearly the most essential thing to think about. Okay, so now back to say. To enable us to form clear and correct practical notions in regard to markets for the products of industry, we must carefully analyze the best established and most certain facts and apply to them the inferences we have already deduced from a similar way of proceeding. And thus, perhaps, we may arrive at new and important truths that may serve to enlighten the views of the agents of industry and to give confidence to the measures of governments anxious to afford them encouragement. Okay? So, in his eloquent style there, he's just saying, let's think through this carefully so that we can enlighten, you know, these merchants and other agents of industry who are lamenting the fact that how come we can't move our products? It must be there's a scarcity of money. Let's help their thinking and let them see the bigger picture and some of these deep relationships to understand more accurately what specifically is going wrong right now. And then also, you know, for the people in government who are getting ready to possibly intervene, let's give them sage counsel too, so that they what they do actually helps and doesn't make things worse. Okay, here we go. A man who applies his labor to the investing of objects with value by the creation of utility of some sort cannot expect such a value to be appreciated and paid for unless where other men have the means of purchasing it. Right? So he's agreeing. You're, you know, some guy who's doing some work to, to bring something valuable to market, he can't exchange that away and get something else that's to him, you know, useful and and justifies all the effort that he put into bringing his wares to market 
unless the other people out there, the possible counterparties to a trade, unless they have the means of buying it, right? So say is agreeing thus far, and then that's kind of where the analysis typically stops for the people lamenting the scarcity of money. They're just saying, oh yeah, I have all this great stuff to sell, and I'd be willing to do it if I found someone who had enough money to make it worth my while to do the sale, but they're not around. Oh, money's scarce, or people are hoarding. So Say has agreed with him up to that point, but then he pushes it. He says, now, of what do these means consist? Right. So he's saying, how is it that your potential trading counterparty comes up with the ability to be able to buy your stuff? Of other values of other products, likewise the fruits of industry, capital, and land. And then this is the money quote which leads us to a conclusion that may at first sight appear paradoxical, namely that it is production which opens a demand for products. Okay, so I think that sentence, I'll read it again, which leads us to a conclusion that may at first sight appear paradoxical, namely that it is production which opens a demand for products. Right, so I think that's where people get, oh, what J.B. Say said was supply creates its own demand. And that's, you know, so that's not the quote, notice, and what he's saying here is true. And he's not saying all production automatically guarantees there's a demand for all the products in the aggregate so that there's no unsold goods. That's not what he said. Rather, he said, it is production which opens a demand for products. All right. So, you know, another way of colloquially putting it is if you're, uh, you know, a cobbler and you want, meat well what how are you going to you know get the butcher to sell you some meat you're going to have to fix some people's shoes maybe not the butchers but somebody else's shoes so then they pay you then you take the money and you buy the meat from the butcher but ultimately when you say how was it that you were able to enter the marketplace and obtain the meat where did you know what was the source of your demand for that meat ultimately it was your supplying of shoe repair services, not necessarily to that particular guy, but, you know, to someone else in the community. And then that's what we're all doing collectively. We're all creating goods and services that we're in a sense bringing to the marketplace. And then that's the means by which we bid on the things other people are bringing. And then we all in the aggregate are demanding other people's products, but ultimately our demands consist of our own supplies that we're bringing to the market. Right, that's what Say is trying to get at here. Let me just read a little bit more. Should a tradesman say, I do not want other products for my woolens, I want money, there could be little difficulty in convincing him that his customers could not pay him in money without having first procured it by the sale of some other commodities of their own. Yonder farmer, he may be told, will buy your woolens if his crops be good and will buy more or less according to their abundance or scantiness. He can buy none at all if his crops fail altogether. And neither can you buy his wool nor his corn yourself unless you contrive to get woolens or some other article to buy withal. You say you only want money. I say you want other commodities and not money. For what in point of fact do you want the money? Is it not for the purchase of raw materials or stock for your trade or victuals for your support? Wherefore, it is products that you want and not money." The silver coin you have received on the sale of your own products and given in the purchase of those of other people will, the next moment, execute the same office between other contracting parties and so from one to another to infinity, just as a public vehicle successively transports objects one after another. If you cannot find a ready sale for your commodity, will you say it is merely for want of a vehicle to transport it? For after all, money is but the agent of the transfer of values." Its whole utility has consisted in conveying to your hands the value of the commodities which your customer has sold for the purpose of buying again from you. In the very next purchase you make, it will again convey to a third person the value of the product you may have sold to others. And da, 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 da. Okay, so I'll stop there. Okay, so what often happens when you read the classical economist is that they abstract away from money's role as a medium of exchange and they reason about the economy as if it were a giant marketplace of barter trades. And that's so the, it, there's strengths and weaknesses in that. 
right? So that it's very useful. If someone just doesn't know anything and they're speaking nonsense, you could help them by just saying, okay, forget money for a second. Let's just think in terms of the underlying, you know, you gave up this real good or service in order to obtain this real good or service. And that's, you know, think of it like that and get a framework. And then you can add in the complexity of, but in reality, using just one-off barter exchanges would be uh, cumbersome and there'd be a lot of potential gains from trade for more complex multi-party trades that wouldn't happen. And that's why, you know, a medium of exchange is useful, which then once the whole community falls on one of those and embraces one of those, then that's what we mean by money. Okay. Oh, and then once there's money prices, then you have economic calculation. You can get all sophisticated stuff until you're smarter than Mises. Okay. But that first step is useful. Just like it, even though it gets made fun of, so-called Robinson Crusoe economics is vital to understanding modern industrial economies with financial markets and call options on pork bellies, right? You need to first understand, oh yeah, some guy washes up on a tropical island and he's got his raw labor power, he's got some natural resources, originally no capital goods, what does he do? How does that work? And you can talk about income and saving and investment and so on, even in that circumscribed framework. <coughs> okay, so likewise here. Maybe that's even one way of putting it. Clearly, when Robinson Crusoe is looking around on his island and wants to increase his standard of living, he said, gee, I'm only, I'm, you know, I'm living on the edge of starvation here, li literally living hand to mouth. And if I, if, I, geez, if I get sick or something, I'm dead because I, right now, there's no margin of error. I have to produce each day enough to feed myself enough so I don't die. This is not a good situation to be in. What do I do? And then, you know, it's clear, well, you could go and uh, find a stick and turn it into a spear. Then now you can increase the productivity with which you obtain fish. You can build a, a ladder so that you can get the coconuts more easily than what you're doing right now and, da, 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 you know, increase the productivity. And you can go through all that stuff. It's not, well, gee, just if there were more money on this island, then my sales would be higher, right? No. It's what... If it's just you, if it's a one-person economy, it's crystal clear your consumption exactly equals your production or anything you consume, you first had to produce. The production could be pretty simple. Like, you know, there's just some piece of fruit lying on the ground and you just pick it up and eat it. But still, in terms of the production process of transforming that natural resource into a finished good, you had to do something. All right, and your consumption is necessarily limited by your production. Even with a two-person economy, right? Crusoe's wondering, he finds Friday, they hit it off, they start engaging in voluntary trades. Even there, it's um, not clear that it would make sense to say, oh, the reason I can't get more stuff from Friday is because he doesn't have enough money to buy my stuff. And then that means I don't have enough money to buy from, you, you know, ultimately if, if Friday has a bunch of cool stuff that he's not willing to trade to you, it's because he doesn't like what you have to trade for to him. And so that's the problem. If, if you're not getting enough from him in order to get the things you want from others, then the issue is because the stuff I'm bringing to market isn't as appealing to him. And so I need to bring better or more items to market. So I have to go produce more in order to get Friday to sell me that cabin that he built, which is what I want. And like right now I offered him one fish for it. And he said, no, get out of here. So the problem's not, oh, if only Friday had more money so that I could charge more for his fish and then I could buy the cabin from him that no, the issue is I need to go get more fish. That's the issue. I haven't produced enough myself, All right? So even in a two-person economy, you can kind of see Say's insights. Now, where it gets a lot trickier is with a 40,000-person economy where clearly everyone has to use money. We're not just engaging in barter transactions. 
And then, yes, once you break the transactions up, and so on every side of one of each trade um, is money, then that's what leads to the superficial diagnosis that, oh, yeah, when there's a slump, the problem is there's not enough money to go around. Money's too scarce. Okay, but you can see that's a superficial way of looking at it. So it's it's useful to first start with the one-person economy and see how scarcity of money has nothing to do with that. It's all about production. Then you can see how even in a two-person economy, ultimately, if you can't get what you want from the other person, it's because you're not bringing enough to the table that the other person wants. It's your production. That's the problem. Um, and so once you think through those, those principles are still true in a end person economy. It's just there's other things too that are laid on top of it because it gets so complicated that you got to keep track of as an economist. But still, those basic truisms pull through. And so that's why it's good to, to establish them. And so if people are pontificating about the end person economy, saying stuff that just thinking through even the Robinson Crusoe example, you could see that, no, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Right? It's so like, it's still true. All the consumption that occurs in a modern economy with billions of people, anything consumed had to have first been produced, right? And if people are starving to death, just creating more money in and of itself doesn't fix that problem. If people are all starving, you need to either produce more or, you know, change the distribution patterns to, you know, reduce waste or, or whatever to take it from areas of relative plenty and get it to the people that are starving. But clearly, just creating more money per se doesn't fix it if the issue is there's not enough food being produced to feed everybody who's alive right now. Money per se doesn't fix that. If it does, it's only because for some reason, you know, the creation of additional money solves the more fundamental production problem. So, um, you know, a sophisticated modern Keynesian could say, yeah, everything, I agree with everything you just said, duh. Of course, we know for, you know, stimulus checks to work and the people go to the grocery store with their stimmy to be able to now buy f stuff on the shelves, that stuff had to first be produced. It's not the stimulus check per se created those goods on the shelves. But the Keynesian would say the potential manufacturers looking ahead aren't going to create that stuff unless they think there's going to be an adequate demand and blah, blah, you know, so that's, they can handle that. I'm just saying though, it's useful to just get your baseline framework set up and that, you know, if we're going down this discussion, we need to say, okay, everyone, let's remember for something to be consumed, it had to have first been produced. All right. And then we can proceed. And, you know, I'm sure the modern Keynesians would say, yeah, we all know that. Well, a lot of people talk as if they don't know that. Okay, let me just make two more points here. So one is, I even, I think, captured it in the direct quotes I read to you. There was a little bit of a non sequitur in Say's argument. All right, he said something like, um, the problem with aggregate, or sorry, the when, when business is slow, you know, and the merchant says, oh, the issue is my customers, you know, don't have enough money to buy my woolens. And then say, says, ah, but where, you know, would your customer come up with the money? It's only by selling, you know, his, bring his wares to market. And so really, if your customer doesn't have enough money, the issue is he didn't produce enough. So, so the, I mean, in the spirit, in the context of what you read, like that's, you get where he's coming from, why but strictly speaking, that's not a great argument, right? Because clearly at some point there was enough aggregate money in the community to support, you know, a normal economic environment, flows of production and so forth and consumption and sales. And then if something gums up the works and this guy who normally would be buying my woolens now isn't, and say just says, oh, well, you know, what, what's the problem here? If he doesn't have enough money, it must be because he didn't produce something valuable enough to get other people to give him the money. Okay, but then that, then that means the other person has the money, right? So I'm just saying if you just kind of narrowly look at the specific arguments Say is making and that's where you stopped, 
that's a bit of a non sequitur, right? All he's really explaining is why that one particular customer now can't buy your woolens. It's not explaining, you know, why the sales dropped off because, you know, somebody else still has that money. So why isn't he buying your woolens, right? So anyway, just uh, making that little nitpick. Um, last main point I'll make here, this is a bit technical, but for those of you in grad school for sure or beyond, often when you get, when you're talking to mathematical economists, they will relate Say's law to what's called Walras's law. And so, you know, Walras had a the first full-blown mathematical general equilibrium description of an economy. And so in that mathematical framework, you can formalize it very easily. You can talk about what's the excess demand for a particular good. So it's just, so in Wal the Walrasian framework, you got all these, you know, list of potential goods and then a vector of possible prices for each good or service. And then you go through and you just calculate, okay, it, with this vector of prices for all the goods and services, how much do the consumers and the producers want to demand and supply in each of those individual goods and services markets? All right. And so if in a, for a given commodity, given the whole vector of prices for everything, you know, because that pins down like what everybody's income is and so, right? So it, that's why it's a general equilibrium framework because there's feedback effects and stuff like that. And so you can just say, though, okay, given the structure of the model, you know, we specified how are goods produced and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, given this possible vector of prices that we're considering, is it an equilibrium where in each market, the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded? Well, there's a, a result that Walras has even outside of equilibrium where in any given market and, you know, any for any given commodity or service, there could be a glut or a, uh, a shortage, right? So for any given commodity, maybe the quantity that the sellers want to sell is higher than the quantity that the buyers want to buy. So in that particular commodity, there would be a glut. And there would be negative excess demand there, right? So excess demand means the buyers want to buy more units of the commodity than they're than the sellers want to sell, right? So the demand is higher than the supply in terms of quantities. Okay, so what while well, Ross showed was even in general, this isn't just an equilibrium condition, just in general, you give me any possible vector of prices and then I go and check, you know, given the feedback effects and stuff, what are the excess demands, which again could be negative if there's a glut in those things. And all of that has to sum to zero. So that's what Walras's law is. All right, and so what that means, if you think it through, is that, oh, so if there's, like, let's say all the market's clear, except there's this excess demand in one market, well, then there has to be an excess supply for at least one other commodity. That's how that works. All right, and if you think it through in terms of barter, it really makes sense, right, that you know, given the ex the potential exchange rate between apples and oranges, if someone wants to sell, you know, if, if the apple sellers want to sell 10 apples, but the apple buyers only want to buy nine, well, then there's a an excess supply of apples, but then that's the accounting flip side of saying there's an excess demand for oranges. All right. So... That's how that stuff works. It can't be that in general there's an excess demand for commodities. So that superficially sounds like, oh, isn't that kind of like Say's law? That but no, for one thing, you know, it's mathematical, and you know, Say's was verbal. But also, again, this is getting real technical. Um, keep in mind that. In a real in a, the real economy where there's money, one of those commodities is the money good, right? And so you could have mathematically, you could say, oh yeah, there's um, 
an excess supply of all the real goods and services, or at least, you know, some of them, and that could be equilibrium in the other markets. And then while Ross's law tells us, oh, so there must be at least one other commodity in the system where there's an excess demand. Right? And then you say, yeah, and if that's the money good, well, then that's consistent with what we mean by a recession. Right? So in a recession, if everybody's, quote, hoarding their money, right, they're trying to, they're trying to sell goods and services to get money, and then they don't want to spend all that money. Everybody on net is trying to add to their money balances. Right? So that's an excess demand for money. People are trying to get more money than money holders want to sell, if you think of it that way. That's what it looks like if there's a rush and people are, quote, hoarding. And then that's mathematically consistent in a Walrasian model with there being an, a glut in all the other goods and services that those people are trying to, you know, because you see how that works? That's what it would mean. If everybody in the community, just to keep it symmetrical, let's just say it's true of everybody, everyone in the community wants to sell $1,000 worth of stuff and only buy $900 worth of stuff because everyone's trying to add $100 to their cash balances. So to, in order to do that, right, you got to sell $100 worth more of stuff than you, than you spend in order for you to, in that period, on net, accumulate an additional $100 that you can add to your cash balances. So you understand why in a, an uncertain economic environment, people would want to do that. They'd want to bulk up on their cash. But the point is, if everyone's trying to do that, and the stock of money is, is fixed for the moment, then that can't happen. That's impossible. And so what, what happens? Oh, how, how are people trying to accumulate more money? How, are they, how do they have an excess demand for money? Is that there's an excess supply for all the other stuff that they're trying to bring to market to get the money. Okay? But that's, that's what we mean by a general glut. So when people say, oh, there's a general glut, they, they're not including the money commodity in that analysis, all right? So the reason I'm going through all that is I think it's like in John Stuart Mill, who, you know, who was writing after Say, what was talking about Say, and then was making the point that I made that, oh, don't think that with Say's approach that that means it's mathematically impossible for there to be a general glut because, again, you could have a general glut in the real goods and services, but a, a, a shortage in the money commodity. And that's, that's what people mean when they talk about there's a scarcity of money. And there's, so where this all goes, it also has to do like with overproduction. You may have heard of that. So that's a popular crude way of explaining what happens during the business cycle is sometimes people say, oh, yeah. There was a boom, and then there was an overproduction. Just in general, businesses made too much stuff, and then they couldn't sell it because the demand wasn't there, and then it just sat unsold, and there's this glut, and it took years to work off, and blah, 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 because there was too And so somebody like J.B. Say would say, no, no, no. What, what do you mean there was too much production? That's how, Again, how are we in 1803 so much wealthier and have such a higher standard of living than the people in 1603 it's because we're all collectively producing more. So it's not, don't tell me that in general, too much production is bad. No, that's, that's how we raise our standard of living. Well, now, what could happen, Say would argue, is maybe one particular line produced too much stuff, but that's because it's, it's reducing the potential output in other lines, right? In, it's not that in general, the economy made too much stuff. It could be that, these particular lines made too much and they should have scaled back because that would have freed up real resources so that other lines could have made more. Okay, so that type of reasoning, um, somebody like John Stuart Mill was saying, yeah, you're right, that's true as insofar as it goes, but don't conclude, therefore, a general glut is impossible where in general all the merchants are saying, yeah, we can't sell because, again, it could be that it's the money commodity is the one where there's the excess demand and then the, you know that all balances out. That's possible. Okay. Last thing I'll say on that. Um, so I'll link in the show. George Reisman has a good essay on this because actually James Mill, John Stuart Mill's father, 
had a very good handling of all this stuff and Reisman thinks John Stuart Mill was a retrogression that that John Stuart Mill was caric uh, setting up a caricature of say with that exposition. Okay, last thing I'll mention in case now you're like, well, so then what does happen? And this has to do with the so-called sticky prices. All right. So if you were, even though you know Walvoros's law shows it's mathematically possible, you could have excess supplies for all the goods and services except for the money commodity where there's an excess demand. That's possible. And then you know somebody like Keynes might say, so therefore let's come in and run a budget deficit, or let's print more money, right? Oh, if if there's if the public wants to, like the earlier example I said, if the public wants to, if everyone's trying to get a hundred more dollars to their cash balances. And that's causing, you know, a, a problem in the system. Then, duh, isn't the answer just the monetary authority comes in and prints up hundred dollars per person and gives them out, and then everybody relaxes, they go back to spending, and then everything's fixed, right? And you could do that if that's the way you narrowly frame the problem, and it's you know, in, in a mainstream economics model of the, with you know mathematics and blah blah blah. That's what could pop out of that system. But notice another way to fix that is that the prices for all the other goods and services just comes down, right? Because when people want to add $100 to their cash balances, really what they want to do is increase the purchasing power of their cash balances, right? Like maybe, you, you're, you know, someone's thinking like, oh, I want to have three months of rent and basic necessities of life in cash sitting in my either checking account or in the vault in my basement like because I'm really fearful of the future. And I would like it to be, even if I get laid off tomorrow, we've got enough literal cash in the home safe here that I can pay my basic emergency bills. And, you know, we do a, 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 a strict uh, no-frills diet for the next three months and I can feed my wife and kids just buying the basic necessities. And we got a three-month window. And so if things get real fearful, you know, maybe I want to push that out to a four-month window, okay? But notice there, the calculations you're going through, it's not literally how many dollar bills do I want or you know, how many total dollars do I need in my cash. It's really you're thinking, because what am I going to have to spend to get these things, right? And so really it's the relationship between how much cash are you holding and how expensive is stuff. And so if... You know, as this panic sets in and everyone's scrambling to acquire cash, if prices are allowed to fall, well, then that can clear the market too, right? So if everybody, again, just to reiterate re the point, if everyone collectively, or sorry, if each individual household is trying to add $100 to its cash balances, if the stock of money doesn't change, that's impossible. But when you push it back and realize, oh, they, that means given the current constellation of prices, Everyone wants to add $100. But now if prices come down, now your existing cash balances can buy more. And so it can be that what if prices just fall enough such that you no longer need to add to your cash balances? Like, oh, the purchasing power now, the amount of goods and services I can get with my existing money holdings is what I wanted before when I thought I needed to add $100 to it because now stuff has become cheaper. So my money goes farther. So if that happens, boom, now everybody can be holding their desired amount of cash balances and they're not trying to sell more than they buy. And now they're willing to sell what they buy equivalently in, in the aggregate. And then, then once that happens, boom, that gets rid of all the general glut and the other sectors, okay? So that's the kind of way you, you handle this stuff as you start getting more technical. Well, I think that's a good spot to wrap up. So again, if you've never read it, I encourage you to go ahead and do it. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes page to some of these items. So now you know a lot more about Say's Law. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.